gentleman may resume. It is disheartening that we stand here today divided, engaging in heated debate about expanding the ability of people to carry concealed weapons, and ignoring the most important issue confronting our country, the jobs crisis. We're debating an effort to undermine the ability of states to protect residents from the scourge of gun violence. And we have before us a bill that will effectively preclude... That's correct. The House is not in order. Will members please take their conversations from the floor? The gentleman deserves to be heard. Thank you. Gen will members please cease their conversations on the floor? The gentleman may resume. We have before us a bill that will effectively preclude states from limiting who can carry a concealed weapon within its borders and for what purpose. While many of my colleagues and I are seriously opposed to the passage of the underlying bill, there still remains an opportunity for us to find common ground. There's a chance for us to unite around a reasonable and common sense amendment which would prevent the privileges in this bill from being extended to some of the most dangerous individuals in our society. Individuals who have or intend to inflict great harm upon our communities and our nation. Let me be clear, this is the final amendment, and passage of this amendment will not kill the bill. It will be incorporated into the final language and immediately voted upon. While many of us may disagree with the underlying intent of this bill, it's hard to imagine anyone would disagree that there are certain individuals that should not be afforded the right to carry concealed, loaded weapons across state lines. It's hard to imagine that anyone would advocate for preserving a path for terrorists, child sex offenders, stalkers, and domestic abusers to transport a loaded gun into another state. Yet these glaring loopholes are present in the underlying bill. And if my amendment is not passed by this body, this dangerous and appalling pathway for violence will remain. For far too long, terrorism has inspired fear in our country and threatened the happiness and safety of our citizens. And while we continue to live in a world that requires constant vigilance, and full awareness of the danger of future terrorist attacks, there is not a single provision in H.R. 822 that would prevent, prevent suspected or known terrorists who acquire concealed carry permits in one state with lax regulations from carrying that same concealed loaded weapon into another state with more stringent regulations. In addition, many current state concealed carry laws do not sufficiently protect victims of domestic violence. A 2007 investigation found that Florida's... This is not in order. Don't make a continue. 2007 investigation found that Florida's licensing system had granted concealed carry permits to more than 1,400 people who had pleaded guilty or no contest to a felony, 128 people with active domestic violence injunctions, and six registered sex offenders. In fact, in 2010, Gerardo Regalado, a man who had a record of violent behavior against women, was able to obtain a concealed handgun permit in Florida. He then went on to commit the worst mass killing in Hialeah, Florida's history when he killed his estranged wife and three other women at a local restaurant. H.R. 822 will force other states to recognize Florida's concealed carry permits, the same permit held by Gerardo Regalado. Finally, there's no protection in H.R. 822 to prevent individuals convicted of a sex offense against a minor from carrying a concealed loaded gun into a state whose requirements might have otherwise prevented that individual from acquiring a concealed carry permit. Child sex offenders, individuals who create unimaginable lasting harm in our communities, should not be allowed to continue to perpetuate fear in the hearts of our children and families. H.R. 822 will force other states to recognize permits issued to these individuals who pose danger to our children. All too often, guns legally end up back in the hands of criminals, and nothing in this underlying bill would impede child sex offenders or domestic violence offenders from carrying their loaded, concealed guns across state lines. In the simplest of terms, my amendment would preclude child sex offenders, domestic violence offenders, and known or suspected terrorists from enjoying the privilege of concealed carry reciprocity uh, authorized in the underlying bill. We owe this common sense amendment 
to our brave law enforcement officials and first responders who bear the greatest responsibility in protecting us from terrorist attacks. We owe this to our nation's children whose innocence is threatened by dangerous individuals who prey on them. We owe this to the victims of abuse who deserve some consolation that the law will not send their abusers legally armed into another state to continue stalking, threatening, and perpetuating abuse. Now is the time for our chamber tonight. Let's demonstrate to the American people that we can use common sense and come together to do what is right. While there is no question that the Second Amendment embodies the right to bear arms, our citizens also enjoy the right to be free from the terror of gun violence. I urge all members to support this motion. Does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? I rise in opposition to the motion to recommit. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Ben, I'd like to remind members that uh, traffic in the well while another member is addressing the House is improper behavior. Gentleman may continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Second Amendment to our Constitution was drafted, debated, and ratified in precisely the same manner as the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth, the Sixth, and other amendments our colleagues on the other side of the aisle find so sacrosanct. And consistent with this belief that liberty and the right to arm oneself are inextricably linked, it is settled law that our Constitution protects the right to travel. It protects the right to self-defense. It protects the right to defend the lives of others. Not once, Madam Speaker, but twice, the Supreme Court has held the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental individual right. And those rights do not know any geographic boundary. Gentlemen's correct. The House is not in order. Members, please take their conversations from the floor. Gentlemen may continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Not once but twice, the Supreme Court has held the right to keep and bear arms as a fundamental individual right. And those rights do not know any geographic boundary. And our right to defend ourselves does not ebb and flow with the vicissitudes of travel or because we transverse a state line. Despite the fact that these rights are protected in the Constitution, there are still those who seek to treat the Second Amendment as a constitutional second class Citizens. Sometimes those efforts, Madam Speaker, to denigrate the constitutional status of the Second Amendment are overt, and sometimes they are obscure. And as much as we appreciate the renewed, and I am sure short-lived, infatuation with states' rights embraced by some of our colleagues on the other side, let me ask you simply this. What limits are you willing to accept with regard to the First Amendment? Does your state want reporters to have to pass a test so they can exercise their First Amendment? Do you want 50 different versions of freedom of religion? What about the Fourth Amendment? Is one state free to dispose of the exclusionary rule because it doesn't agree with it? Do we have 50 different versions of what's a reasonable search and seizure? What about the Fifth Amendment? Do we have 50 different versions of Miranda? What about the Eighth Amendment? Are there 50 different versions of cruel and unusual punishment? We are delighted, Madam Speaker, to have our colleagues rediscover the beauty of the Tenth Amendment and the concept of state rights. Eventually, we hope the same for the Second Amendment. This motion to recommit is offered to jettison the underlying bill and further relegate the Second Amendment to a constitutional scrap heap. All of these amendments were dealt with in committee, Madam Speaker, and the matters of state law classifications are just that, state law. The fact that certain state legislatures refuse to protect their citizens does not mean this body will refuse or abdicate its responsibility to defend the Second Amendment. This bill, Madam Speaker, H.R. 822, has 245 co-sponsors. More than half the members of this body, and it enjoys that wide and diverse support because it is emblematic of our forefathers' genius. They gave us the fundamental right to travel. They gave us the fundamental right to protect ourselves. They gave us the fundamental right to protect others. And they gave us the fundamental obligation to defend liberty. I urge my colleagues to oppose this, mission, this motion, and I yield back the balance of my time. <laughs> 
without objection, previous question is ordered. The questions on the motion to recommit. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The noes have it. Ask for a recorded vote, please. The gentleman from Rhode Island has asked for a recorded vote. Those favoring a recorded vote shall rise. A sufficient number having risen, recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 and Clause 9 of Rule 20, the 15-minute vote on the, on the motion to recommit will be followed by five-minute votes on passage, if ordered, and the motion to suspend the rules on H.R. 674. This is a 15-minute vote. 